You know, much as I hate to give Thomas J. Doyle too much credit, he might have gotten a hold of something when he said that was pretty private stuff going on out there. I wonder if it's ethical to watch a man with binoculars and a long focus lens. Do you, do you suppose it's ethical even if you prove that he didn't commit a crime? I'm not much on rear window ethics. Whatever happened to that old saying, no fly neighbor? <laughs> you know, I think I'll start reviving that tomorrow. Welcome to a 2018 edition of The Fear of God, where we explore the intersection between Christianity and the horror genre. And exploring that intersection every single week without fail is myself, Reed Lackey, and the one, the only, the ever impressive, the often imitated but never duplicated, Nathan Rose! Happy New Year! Happy What's New up, Year, buddy. Riri. 2018. Oh. We are creeping that much closer to mine and yours 20 year. Are we allowed to call it an anniversary? <laughs> Given some of the things you and I have been through, yes. We'll let the readers use their imagination on that one. <laughs> the readers, the, the listeners. Readers. <laughs> you can tell, you can tell we're recording in December, the peak of crazy town and oh, minimal sleep and maximal responsibility. Maximal. Maximal. Yes, indeed, indeed. So, uh, so yeah. So happy listeners. New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. As you listeners are hearing this, uh, 2017 has come and gone. Um, with it, evidently, my health. Some of you may notice that I sound a little congested, a little sick. I'm still battling over uh, a cold uh, that has been lingering uh, by this point now for weeks. So, that's, uh, that's devastating. But um, we're ringing in 2018 with a series that I am extremely excited about. Uh, I'm so thrilled to have us be discussing this series. We're going to do similar to what we did with Universal, um, but with a slightly different format. Uh, we're going to be doing a year-long series, a series that we tag in on about once a month or so. Uh, there may be a month here or there where we do two, uh, or we may skip a month here or there. But throughout the year, we're going to be revisiting the films of the one, the only Alfred Hitchcock I'm so excited for this, Nathan. You are excited. I, I know am, you are. I am gleeful. We need to come up with like a like a hashtag of some kind, you know, like a... Wait, a what you got? <laughs> well, like Holy Hitchcock, you know, or uh, hitchcock a doo do you know, or something. Wow. You know, or, uh, I came up with a couple ideas. Oh, so, let me hear them. Let me hear them. So you won't like them, but they're fun. Um, and we won't really use them unless it's just purely in jest and as utter irony, <laughs> um, which I'm a fan of in general. So... You know, you and I played around with some hashtags that are not really fit for a yeah. relatively family-friendly They'd be for podcast. the R-rated Wrath of God albeit, episode. Albeit, what's funny about us being a relatively family-friendly podcast is that the material we tend to cover is anything but family-friendly. That's a good point. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless. Um, so, yes, we did jokingly discuss a couple of hashtags that would be suitable for hair. Harry Hitchcock's last name. Um, <laughs> but uh, avoiding that, I, I kind of leaned into, well, what about his first name? You, you ready for one? You ready oh, for one? I'm, I'm going. So I'm going. I thought, I thought like, this is, this is really bad. I'm starting 2018 off, off well. Uh, hashtag Alfred from Melmac. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is a deep cut 80s, 80s it is. reference it for is. anybody who doesn't And oh, I, only have, I only have one other one. It's a bit more serious. It's a bit more in the wheelhouse of what we tend to do. Okay. The other one was hashtag Alfred Letters. Oh, okay. Oh, I get it. No, I get, get it. it. Because, yeah, get it? because because Alf from Melmac is writing the words of Jesus down. <laughs> that's what he's <laughs> That's what he's doing. No, no, no. You, you're missing. No, the second one has nothing to do with Alf. It's just purely a syllable. A syllable correlation. <laughs> right, right, I mean, right. I, I like the image of Alf reading the Bible and coming to Jesus, but that's really, the second one was not meant to conjure Alf, whereas the first uh, one Do unto was. others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> hey, Willie. <laughs> Where's uh, the cat? So yeah, we are we ridiculous. we are it is, it is. But the but hey, it's us and it's twenty eighteen. The the listeners expect no less but Good utter point. utter asinine and you know, occasional insightful conversation. Every once in a while. Tag it yeah. a little bit. Um, so yeah, so we're we're going to be launching in today with something that I'm very excited about. You want me to go ahead and tell them what we're talking about, and then we'll we'll k- take care of a little business, or do you want to wait? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Cause, okay, because because it's thematically resonant on so many levels. Yeah. Sure, sure. So we thought uh, no no better fitting place to launch uh, a year long series about Alfred Hitchcock, um, and at simultaneously looking back at the year that has come and gone uh, by starting with uh, what. The birds? Uh, no, not quite the birds. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Marnie, Psycho. As a Psycho. Fact, oh, Psycho no, 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 would no. kind of work as a 2017 <laughs> retrospective. For 2017? Yes, <laughs> exactly. it would. Exactly. Yes, it would. As would Vertigo. Um, but oh, uh, yeah, but no, so, so we're going to begin with the... Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. Not to tip my hand too, too steadily, but Rear Window. 1954's Rear Window is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but first of all, Nathan, listeners may or may not know that you know we banked a lot of episodes towards the end of the year, so it's been quite a while since I've had the privilege to ask you. Um, wow. What you watch and what you read and what you listening to. Wow. Are you still going? No, no, no. What's I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a what's stop. amazing I'm a stop. is how impressive that is, and I never, ever would have been able to do that, but you just did. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really glad you brought us into 2018 with that little rendition of what you watch and read and listen to. You're welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to rant during mine. Do you want to go first? Do you have Ooh, one? Um, I have a very brief one. Um, That's all right. Uh, yeah, no, but honestly... Um, through a large chunk of December, um, m- primarily because it was leaving Netflix and I had always intended to check it out, um, I did a big binge on a show that I had seen before but had not watched more than like the first couple of seasons of. Um, so I did a much more extensive, nearly complete binge of it before uh, it left Netflix because it was easy to just sort of have on in the background while I was doing other stuff. Have you ever heard of a show called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? I have heard of a show called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It is wildly offensive. It sure. is incredibly I've heard offensive. as much. Um, and supremely clever and very sharp and funny. And if you can, ha- I, I mean, huge asterisk of disclaimer that you have to be able to handle wildly offensive content. Like when I say it's offensive, I don't just mean that they occasionally throw a stereo. Like every episode is right. designed to push buttons and make you upset about something. If you have any soapboxes at all, um, it's intended to subvert that. Um, but uh, And the characters are all terrible people. Like, they're all just horrendous human beings. Um, but it is very, very funny. It is yeah. really solid. It is very funny. If you like that kind of biting, more acerbic black humor, uh, then it's it's definitely very rewarding in that I context. Like, I, like, I like the word acerbic. Yes, acerbic is a good word. Um, so yeah, I just I watched about uh, eight seasons of. Wow, it's always well. I mean, they're they're ten to thirteen episodes each, so it's not that intensive. Okay. And and twenty. So minutes, only um, only ninety episodes. Some somewhere around there. It, yeah. <laughs> I told you I could have it on the background, so I would plow through yeah, like half a yeah. season in a day. You know. And you're like um, ha 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 f bomb. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I really I really have no judgment. But um, but no. So I mean. Again, you know, if you're into that kind of thing and have not yet checked it out. How many seasons are there? Uh, they're coming into, they're making 13 right now, or, or 13 would be the next place to go. They've had 12. Um, wow. So, so, yeah, if they have a 13th and 14th season, I think that would tie them with Ozzy and Harriet for the longest running 
uh, live action sitcom uh, in I, television. Now, history. I did not know it was live action. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's live action. Um, and Danny DeVito comes in, joins them in the second season. I think it may be my favorite thing Danny DeVito has ever done. He is even the even the penguin, even, even the penguin, the penguin. He is so perfect for this role. It is it is like tailor made for his comedic sensibilities. It is he's wonderful in it. The whole cast is wonderful. even They're twins. All even twins? I, I do love twins. I do really? love twins. Yeah, I, do, I, I love twins. Twins is, I mean, come on. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. I know. And they're twins. You've heard about, okay, side tangent. You brought it up. It's Please. your fault. I know. You've heard that, they're, that they are developing a sequel. I'm not joking. This is not a joke. They are developing a sequel. It is in so development. Kind of a, a companion called, of twins. Called Triplets. Danny DeVito set to reprise his role. Arnold Schwarzenegger set to reprise his role, and as their long lost third sibling, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> I'm actually not. I'm actually not joking. I get like, it. It's, it's, I get it because he's black. That's yeah. why it's funny. That's but it's I don't. Funny. I don't know if it'll ever see the light Short, of day. Buff and black. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, uh, given Schwarzenegger's sort won't. of uh, no, given his sort of dodgy return to cinema, I don't know if it'll ever fully take off, but if it does... Is it dodgy? Uh, I thought he was, like, officially returned. No, no, no. What I mean is that he... I mean, he full-blown full, full blown went back into films, and he started making movies again, but they have had dodgy returns on investment. Oh, right, um, right, 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 So, he is not the... Sadly, is not the bankable superstar that he was in his heyday, and so... Um, so I don't know if if his his projects are getting a little riskier. So I don't know if it'll actually see fruition. But man, I hope it does because I will I will watch that movie. It'll be stupid, but I'll watch it. it yeah, um, this is fun. It's been a while since we've, we've recorded. It's been quite yeah. a while. It has it? been. Yeah, yeah. Um, Listeners have felt no lack. And this is for this us, is going to be well. this is going to be a bit freewheeling. So Reed, you have you haven't been able to see this yet, and so I'm going to be. It's going to be spoiler free. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! But I did go see the Last Jedi. Okay. Um, yeah, you better be on, very careful. On, on oh, I am. I am. Now, I guess here's a question: Can I allude to thematic ideas that don't spoil anything plot-wise? Okay. So, uh, okay, here's a here's a way of putting it thematically. Here's a question for you. Okay. What did What did you feel about the Force Awakens? Like, as you uh, assess, okay. sort of in the rear in the rear window. Oh. What do you think of The Force Awakens? What was your experience there? Uh, For Force Awakens had some really nice moments. There were a couple of things that I liked a lot about it. I felt like it was a bit too beholden to the narrative formula that was established with A New Hope. So what I really loved was I loved some of the new characters, most especially Rey. Um, mm -hmm. But in large part, the overall narrative uh, for me was largely forgettable because it was so akin right. to A New Hope. But I, I, right. I loved what they did with Ray, and I'm I'm optimistic for where they may go with the rest of the franchise. But yeah, that's a that's a well. Short okay, so see what I what I will say thematically in just a second about the Last Jedi won't spoil anything. And, and oh, okay, we'll, okay, okay. So so I am very similar, and I don't know if you felt that in the watching of the force awakens i remember watching the force awakens and at about the 30 minute mark noting okay well, you know y'all are y'all are making some interesting a new hope echoes and then sure. by like the hour and a half mark you're like okay these aren't echoes anymore this is like straight up copy and paste color by number yeah. storytelling but but like you i i have three daughters you don't have three daughters but like you i loved ray i have three daughters Thus, right. my affection for that character just was enormous. And, you know, we'll, I would point to Ray's summoning of the lightsaber in the snow battle as oh, one of great. my favorite moments, maybe of the last five years or so of, of film. Yeah, was um, it, it really uh, it really resonated emotionally. Uh, I, I watched that moment and thought, holy cow, my children, my daughters get to grow up with Ray as their sort of action hero in a way right, that right. you and I did with Luke Skywalker, Luke Skywalker and that sort of thing. Um, I, I actually really liked, although he got a lot of uh, shade, um, I really liked Kylo Ren. Um, I mm. thought it was an interesting, I, I like Adam Driver. So I came in right, right. Pred predisposed to appreciate his performance. And found what many called the emo Kylo Ren, an actual, actually just kind of an interesting sketch of a character. Sure. Um, so, 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 so your assessment of The Force Awakens 
what you might have wanted out of the force awakens in terms of what how you just described it, the cut and paste like right, that being right. slightly a, dis, a, a letdown yeah absolutely you know I mean? yeah 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 a small la- little, like, makes it more forgettable sure well the last jedi takes what you might have expected out of a brand new movie and it actually delivers that interesting um, there, okay. there are there are interesting takes on kind of the mythology some of the narrative elements they prop up in the force awakens that get addressed in the last jedi are in very interesting ways so see i'm not spoiling anything no, no um, good. okay good um as far as my appreciation for the movie i think like like any movie you kind of come away liking and so i did like it and and would say even more than that uh, perhaps loved it sure. um but like anything, it's it's imperfect. Sure. The the opening few minutes are really strong. There's sort of a little bit of a saggy middle area. And then the last, it's a pretty long movie. It's like two and a half hours. But the last mm. um, hour, hour 15 or so, I adored. Like, like okay. I am anxious to get back to the theater, if only to watch that latter hour again. So Interesting. Here's where I'm going to pivot to introducing some thematic ideas to our conversation that are going to echo hopefully through the rest of the conversation, oh. even with perhaps rear window. Okay. Um, sure. Riri. Nathan. So I made this like really bold statement the other day on Twitter. You may have seen it. You never and do I that. S- no, I don't. Um, and I said, there are two words that I may resist self-application, self-applying in 2018. And those two words are Christian Whoa! And fan. Uh, and fan. Oh, okay. okay. Christian mm-hmm. and fan. Mm-hmm. F A N. The yeah. word fan. Um, we can we can unpack the Christian one if we want to. Don't worry. I adore Jesus Christ. I think he's the hope of the world. I am bored and exhausted to death by the Christians of America, and thus sort of have very little interest in that association much anymore. But that's a whole other let me, thing. Let me yeah, let me pause you real quick because. Because I agree with you. So let me let me nuance that a little bit. I've had a multitude of Facebook conversations. And so let me just say, I agree with you. I think it is, let, let's call it the mainstream face of American Christianity. Because I do sure. think there's a multitude of people who, a, surprising, a surprisingly hopeful amount of boots on the ground people that I have spoken to that uh, that would probably echo the same frustrations. Right. So so I think, you know, specifically yes, sort of I the, think, the verbal majority. Yes. And sort of like take shelter. Perhaps this conversation is going to be a little bit different in sort of format and structure. I'd but be fine with that. I, I, I am I am not by any means suggesting there aren't fantastic people of faith doing amazing work. Sure. Um, of course that, it, that, it, yeah. that is kingdom centered and is beautiful and right and and dare we say holy so 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 putting a slight pin there though this may sort of dovetail back into it dude i am sick to death of fan culture uh Mm -hmm. wait wait until you've seen the last jedi do whatever you can to avoid i don't even care about spoilers that's not you know like there are a couple of significant elements to the movie that you could say if you learned it are kind of spoilers. Okay, fine. But, but the, the, um, what I'm referring to is there is a, there's a blowback from the fan community or from nerddom, from fandom on some of the, um, some of the, the, the pivots and moves that Ryan Johnson incorporates into his written and directed story. Oh, you're talking about yes. entitlement right here. We're, we, oh, yes, a, brother. There's a yes. whole bunch of yes. Annie Wilkes yes. running around. Don't want yes. you messing yes. with their Star Wars. Yes. Okay. Yes. I gotcha. I gotcha. With sled, with sledgehammers and wood chippers. Ready I gotcha. To go. Okay. So I am like, you know how we always talk about, we, we pit, moke, uh, poke fun at the, we made it for the fans sort of mentality yeah, yeah we've done that. and you know how yeah. mm-hmm. you know how generally those movies are terrible right <laughs> for the most part yes yes i, I mean really like yeah we made it for the fans is usually the pr when a movie is doing poorly and you know right. the 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 critics hate it but this tiny subculture of fandom loves it because you so, don't have to you don't have to qualify it if it really was made for the fans because the fans will adore it and they'll go exactly like, well yeah. Well, I'm thinking, I'll tell you what I'm thinking of, and I don't want to dismantle your rant, is I'm thinking of, like, Freddy vs. Jason is a movie that was absolutely made for the fans, and critics tanked it, but 
it's it's perfect for the fans. Sure, like, it, fans of that franchise. That's just one random right. example, but that's yes. what I mean when you don't have to qualify it. You don't have to yes. justify. But Freddy vs. Jason isn't made with the intention of every human on the planet buying a ticket. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's you know for, I mean? it's specifically for right. fans of right. those franchises. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't a case where they tried to make a Freddy vs. Jason that was intended that every human on the planet buy a ticket. Then they didn't, and they then they just said we made it for the fans after all, <laughs> right. which is what a lot right. of these blockbusters are doing right now. So yeah. what is fascinating? What is fascinating? To me, about the some of the deep culture response to the Last Jedi is, dude. I I might be wrong. Uh, I don't think I am. I think you will go watch the Last Jedi and you will finish that movie. At minimum, you will say, you know what? There are a couple things that okay, maybe I would have tweaked or might have done a little differently. But overall, I really liked it. Like that'll be your minimum. I think that is your baseline, okay. and it is mm-hmm. possible you will say, oh my gosh. That is really cool. The things that thematically he decided to do that uh, move pieces and this this universe down the board, down the field in pretty mm-hmm. substantial ways. Um, and and I think this is what's fascinating to me. What I wrote down, you can you can bleep me if you want or edit it out. I just said nerds lose their shit and I'm so sick of it. Like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so. I'm going to make an odd sort of incorporation here, pivoting back to my sort of Christian comment a minute ago. But I look at, um, I, I had this thought recently. These these are all going to tie together, sort of, maybe. You can help me. You know, we have gracious listeners. It's the middle of December. I've got Christmas on the brain. I do this play, The Birth. It's very much a different version of our traditional sort of church presentation of Christmas. And so so I'm, 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 in, the, I'm in the bandwidth of alternate angles on a thing. Okay. Right, right, right. So, right. so, so that's kind of the approach here. I've been thinking a lot about this recent Alabama election, and I don't want to spend a ton of time there, but I remember reading folks talking about Bible believing this and Bible believing that like the, mm. like the phrase Bible, Bible believing. believing. Right. right. And, and, and how that gets used. Um, you didn't know I was going to like go just this hard, deep and fast so well, quickly just, did you yeah, right right yeah, yeah. Uh, it's rear window but <laughs> yes yes so we're looking back at 2017 okay good see you're helping me out with that because <laughs> the last jedi and i'm going to take it a step further and say i think jesus is interested Whoa! in our in our ability to look at the past acknowledge it draw perhaps some important elements out of it and then face fully forward mm. with what we had and what was valuable, look at those altars, build altars if necessary, and move forward with renewal hmm. and rebirth, if you will. So anyway, back to this Bible believing sort of statement, what I don't see, at least in the things I expose myself to, and people may not believe this, but I try to expose myself to relatively broad points of view, what I don't see in these cultural conversations about expressions of christianity what i don't see is it cast through the lens of jesus mm. what i do what i do see is well bible believe in this or bible believe in that okay, yeah, okay well no. <laughs> who knew this is a, hey, welcome 2018 everybody happy new year hi everybody um this is actually a surprise wrath of god episode you did not know yes. spoiler alert here we go no it really isn't it really isn't because ultimately what i think you would say what i would definitely say is there's a version of faith that is good and beautiful and right and true that Jesus wants to cultivate in all of us. Mm -hmm. And there's a version of believing. You see the distinction there? Faith and believing. Oh yeah. There's a version of believing that says, let me hold on to the toys and the archaic expressions of the past that keep me comfortable and safe in my little hovel and for the nerds, it's the basement for people of belief. It is quote unquote Bible believing these ways that we actively resist the spirit pushing us to renewal. And I I, like, I know this is random to tie into like the last Jedi, but it it really spurns these conversations, especially Mm. when you look at some of the reaction to it. And it's like, Man, I am so tired. You, I'm going to ground this a little more in sort of artistry. Next week, we're talking about It Comes at Night, and this is going to tie in, interestingly. Um, a spoiler alert, by the way. Um, 
uh, this is going to tie in interestingly to there. Okay. The ability to accept what a filmmaker actually wants to give you mm. versus, yeah. Yeah. versus what you demand coming in the door. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, sure. and it's so fascinating to me. And I, we can, we can end this part of the conversation because, you know, but, but I'm thinking about rear window and just this sort of looking back mentality, yep. um, this sort of retrospective mentality. And, and it's interesting, like, hear me, I came out of the last Jedi. And when I started seeing the negative responses, I was like, I can't believe this. Like, mm, yeah. I can't believe yeah, yeah, this. Yeah. This is so stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, not because it's a perfect film. I'm not saying that. But because it no, is interesting and fascinating and progressive, if you will, in a way that The Force Awakens was not at all. Sure, I understand. The Force Awakens was solid, and it created, added some really nice toys to the toy box in Rey, Kylo Ren, Finn, Phasma, Poe, BB-8. Those are great characters. They're, sure, they really are. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. But The Force Awakens was kind of, it's, it, it's got diminishing returns, you know. Like, yeah, right, right. I understand. I so have, yeah, I went to see the Last Jedi, and here we are. And I'm okay, just, so yeah. I, I have I have thoughts. Um, okay, Please. so yeah. so um, in rapid, I paint with I paint with broad brushes, and you know, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not actually. I don't think I'm going to nuance what you said that much. Uh, just add sort of my own salt and pepper to the to the stew. Um, so like here's here's what I was sort of ruminating on. I will always, yeah. I think always, and I think you can consistently look back at some of my opinions that I've thrown out here and there uh, in terms of arts and creativity. I will always applaud artists for trying to do something different. Always. And the first thing that I that my mind went to is I was not a fan of uh, Man of Steel or Batman versus Superman, sure, et cetera. Sure. Um, and here's what, and I had a conversation, a really good, substantial, like meeting of the minds kind of conversation with a with somebody not on the internet uh fa- face to face um over some hot tea uh in the past couple of weeks and i was telling them i was like you know when i say i don't like man of steel one of the first places that a lot of real proponents of that film will go is they will say well you just don't like that they did something different to superman you don't like that they you know tried to take superman in some different directions to which i almost immediately slam my foot down and say no 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 I love Tim Burton's Batman, and when you look at comics at the time and look at Tim Burton's Batman, you don't get much different in terms of like changing the dynamics of everything. So I do think that there is a place to reinvent the wheel. I sure, I, would, sure. I crave hearing about it and watching that documentary. I crave what Tim Burton might have done with the Superman mythos and taking it into some bizarre, strange places. I love when artists do something different. My problems with Man of Steel, which we don't get, we won't get into in substan- substance right here, but I'll be happy to dialogue with listeners about. My problems with Man of Steel is I think it undermines its own thematic exploration. So I'm looking at the film in and of itself. itself right, right. By it's itself. confused. Yes. And I think that it's trying to explore some things that I admire it for trying to explore, but I think it's narrative undermines what it's going after so that having been said if we're looking at like i i love it when an artist will try to bring something new to the table as we're sitting here talking maybe you know in a while we'll see something fizzle of this or something come of it but quentin tarantino has evidently gotten paramount and jj abrams on board with an r-rated star trek which to me i'm like that feels false. I don't. I don't. Sure, I don't understand sure. why you would need to do an R-rated Star Trek. I, I. I love Star Trek. Why would you need to do that? But at the same time, I'm like, I'll. I mean, sure. He, he. He got him on board. Let's see what he brings to the table. Let's see what it all. And and like, I. I root for it. I root for it to work. Try something different. Try something a little out of the box. And I root for it to work. Uh, uh, tying that back into your conversation about about faith, is, I think we. I'll say this, and then yeah, we could, we've already kind of been going a while, so we can uh, pivot into the film itself. Listeners are like, "Wow, they just leave." <laughs> with this stuff. Um, but I will say this: we in 2017, 2018 now, um, we have lost sight, uh, or at the very least, have lost have lost emotional resonance with how upending and scandalous Christ's presence in the world was when he came. We have lost sight of how uprooting it was, of how of what a sea change it was. They do not kill someone just 
to to silence and annoyance you know like like the entirety of the religious elite at that time almost the entirety because there was joseph of arimathea and nicodemus almost the entirety of the religious elite were like this man is a threat a right. tremendous huge right. threat to what we're going for and we as believers and as followers I'm not commenting on anybody's specific theolo- theology or specific touch points. I'm just saying I feel that we sometimes lose sight of exactly how different and revolutionary his coming and his presence was. Uh, I right. mean, there, was a, there was a reason why they were all fed to lions. There was a reason why, uh, before he became Paul, why Saul was persecuting them and stoning them. Like, I'm talking about the Christians following Christ, of course. Um, sure. So, th- th- it was a scandalous message it was a message that people did not swallow easily and palatably so i get frustrated when people on one side make it so saccharine that they make it uh, almost like a hippy dippy love child kind of thing i get really frustrated by that i get equally frustrated by people who uh cannot see the forest for the trees in terms of understanding like hey we cannot be so rigid we must be pliable we must be open uh to to hearing what god would want to say to the people and where he would want to take us from this point uh into the future um so so yeah just to echo and salt and pepper some of what what you're saying um i will always and i don't i don't reject your notion because i understand where you're coming from and i even agree with the sentiment um i will always probably call myself a fan and i will always probably call myself a christian and if anybody uh begins to attach labels and meanings to those kinds of things uh, i will do my best to educate them on what i mean by that and educate them uh, that you know what it is not what it is what fan is not means you can't play around with my mythology what christian sure, is not sure. means uh i can't divorce my mentality and my emotion from the redemptive work that christ shed every last drop of his blood for you know like you're like that right 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 that, that's something that that is is sacred to me to a to a point well well and and uh, you know uh, happy new year everybody so um <laughs> like no i i i feel like this is a valuable conversation just and and may may provide the spine for our year who knows um you know unintentionally so here but like hear me man i don't i i know sometimes i i I may come off as glib uh or or too quick to dismiss the fan thing yes the christian comment these aren't like not that you're not saying they are i'm just perhaps i'm i'm defensive towards potential listener uh, response here or, or or you know, uh, feel it reaction here, but like, these aren't just sort of, okay, I'm done with that. And this isn't me like stating those right, things. I mean, I, right. I, I, like I said, I stated it on Twitter. I had a person I went to high school with who, um, you usually, you know, rah, rah is things I say on Twitter and, and she, she took umbrage with the statement and, and, sure, sure. you know, was like, do you, do you think Muslims who it, it, it to me, it was a bit of a weak analogy, but I'll, I'll give her some credit for, for, you know, pushing back and, and this isn't me dismissing that, but she's like, do you think Muslims are, are ready to dismiss the, the name just because of terrorism, terror, you know, right, extremist right. extremism. Mm-hmm. And, and here's the thing, man, one, she, she's not a Muslim, but two, I'd say, I bet there probably are. There are at least some I've talked to a few, you know? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Who, and, and, you know, I think that it is, it is, it is a, because I've thought a lot about this in, in these, these last few days, um, since really pouring over these ideas. And I think what we call a thing matters. Um, I think the yes. essence of, I think what, I think the essence of a thing matters more. Um, and because she asked me, she, she said, well, well, what would you prefer to be called or something like that? And I said, well, and, you know, this isn't me being snarky, sincerely, but I was like, well, you know, Jesus doesn't actually use the word Christian. Like this, this is a, this is a, I'm not going to say it's this modern sort of thing. That's not what I mean, but because I do think it appears in Acts, but, um, it does, you know, words that do have resonance and application of, of faithful and follower and disciple. And, and it isn't, I was about to say, it's not my interest to, argue semantics though clearly that is what i'm proposing here um and i think you understand the heart of what i'm trying to say 
I do. Uh, I do. This is this is just an this is an, this is an ongoing internal conversation as I watch what happens because what happens in the culture, um, which isn't meant to suggest, well, you should naturally look to culture for how you cultivate your interior life, but it is to suggest that the interior life that I feel like Christ calls us to cultivate ultimately will come will come into conflict with culture. And, mm-hmm. you know, ob- observing this last season, um, perhaps the entirety of 2017, of those who do call themselves Bible-believing, those who do tout the name of Christian and think, I don't think I'm that, you know? We're, we're getting into some very existential conversation here. Um, sure, sure. You know, but but I wanted to respond to your statement because because you, I know you... You like the last word. No, 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 <laughs> no. I mean, I, I, I do, that but that really joke. wasn't the intention there. Uh, I just mean like you, you, your the strength of your statement of I will always call myself this, and I, I respect and understand and honor that. Um, because what is interesting about that is I think you and I are very similar theologically. Um, yes, but some of yes. the some of the some of the execution may end up a bit dissimilar. Um, but anyway, so that is. What you're watching, what you're reading. <laughs> there's, no, there's no song for that. That's, uh, what just, uh, are you carrying around? <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you up at night? This is a whole new segment for 2018. What, uh, what listeners oh. also don't know is that uh, you and I usually, in the natural rhythms of our life, you and I usually tag in about maybe once or twice a week with each other. If not um, a day. Just, just, yeah, just uh, chatting life and catching up on thoughts and ideas. But we have not had much chance to. So a lot of the last half hour of what you've just heard is Nathan and I saying hi to each other. That's just kind of how we say <laughs> hi to each other you know, in general. Because, so, I mean, very very frequently our conversations yes. will usually be like, hey, man, so listen, I don't think I'm going to call myself a Christian anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's nothing, there's no, nothing loaded, I'm, I'm, there's nothing I'm loaded about that statement whatsoever. <laughs> this is just this um, is just this is just day to day for you and I. Yeah, this is the this is you know we just call this Tuesday. Um, right, right. But but no, seriously, there's a there. I'm sure some of that, uh, at least to a degree, may come up again in the film that we're going to discuss. And boy, you know, we've already been going about a half hour, but boy, there is a lot to talk about with this movie. Um, Rear window, 1954. I have spent what listeners, some of our listeners are also members over at uh, our friends over at Feel and Film, and they're part of that discussion group. Uh, so some of those listeners know that I've been spending 2017 uh, watching the films of Alfred Hitchcock in chronological order. That was a huge impetus for us doing this series, as I had stumbled upon quite a few that I was like, okay. This is definitely fodder for fear of God conversation, even if it's not strictly horror by the truest definitions, uh, is definitely enough in the genre and uh, ripe for conversation for us to discuss. So I've been watching the films of of Alfred Hitchcock, and uh, whenever I get to this one, I just adore and love it all the more. Now, tell me a little bit about your history with it. Like, I know you, I think you had seen this before, right? But was this like, your yeah, time or yeah, what, this what was, was this, this was number two. Um, number two. what, what do you do? Number two. That's my business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't remember, but a number of years ago I went through, so I saw, in terms of Hitchcock and my familiarity with him, or, or uh, Alfred from Melmac. Um, <laughs> I mean, I saw The Birds in high school, um, yeah. but as an adult, it's probably been close to a decade ago. But I did traipse through a few of the highlights. Like I have seen Psycho. Sure. Is North by Northwest, him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have we may seen cover that. it at some point. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if I've seen Vertigo. No, I think I've seen Vertigo. I've not seen Rope. Oh um, man, Rope is so dang good. Oh. But I had I had seen Rear Window. Um, okay. so this was this was a second viewing for me on that. Do you want to like get into the movie now or? Yeah, I have just a few bits of trivia, um, but uh, but yeah, then we can dive right into the film. I'll, I'll keep this brief and just sort of rattle off a bunch. Did you have any trivia to share? Nope. Okay, all right. I'll just keep this brief then. Um, 
Mr. Thorwald, played by Raymond Burr, who would later go on to play Perry Mason, um, or actually might be concurrent. Is that, with Perry the, Mason. Is that the, the, the killer? The killer, yes. Um, okay. His appearance is very specifically based on a producer called uh, named David O. Selznick, for whom Hitchcock had made a few of his earlier films. You re, uh, listeners want. I keep wanting to call them readers. You know, whatever, whatever you're doing. However, they're smart. Maybe, they read. maybe you've maybe you've transcribed this or something. <laughs> that, that, that'd be a, that'd be a bit of an odd step, but whatever. <laughs> um, listeners won't know that I just made big eyes at Reed. See yeah. Tim Tim Burton again, um, <laughs> and uh, because. A few years ago, I produced a play called Don't Cry For Me, Margaret Mitchell, um, which features a character version of David Selznick because yes, he was yes. the screenwriter of Gone With the Wind, right? Uh, no, producer, he's a producer. He's producer, producer of Gone With the Wind, yeah. Um, well, he was yeah. the producer of a number of Alfred Hitchcock's films, and Hitchcock had a notoriously challenging relationship with him because Hitchcock is a very meticulous and, let's say it, controlling filmmaker. He um, knew exactly what he wanted right down to the T. And uh, you want to know what's really funny about this as I'm recalling it. So I was in this play. I think I was, I think I was Selznick. That is (laughs) hilarious. I don't have the cast list in front of me because there's only three, only three male characters in it. And it's, Oh crap! I can't remember the names. But if he's like a if if, if he's like a, a a boorish producer, yes, I think I played David Sutton. <laughs> that is hilarious. That is hilarious. So yeah, the, Sorry, so carry on. Um, Alfred Hitchcock uh, twice will will it'll come up again when we when we talk about rope eventually. But um, yeah, he specifically patterned the look of the killer after the way David Oselznik <laughs> looked. Um, so yeah. Um, the, uh, the other few bits of trivia that I have, the set itself, uh, that was an actual set on the Paramount lot. They built this little tenement house, uh, tenement complex. Um, it took months of preparation, uh, and construction cost about a hundred thousand dollars. I don't know what that is in 1954 funds, but it was a massive but, but amount. But you don't have a hundred thousand dollars. I don't have a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> um, uh, what's really, what's, uh, what's also interesting to note for cinephiles is that, uh, after the first three shots of the film, there is no musical score in the film. Every other sort of soundtrack component is what we call diegetic, which means that it is of the natural world. It's, it's something that the characters in the film right. also hear. So if there's music, that means it's symphony playing you know, in the complex or it's, it's something that the other characters can also hear, which I find interesting. Like the pianist. Yes. This, I really want to make I really want to make a trivial bits joke. But, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> keep keep trying. Um so uh the last bit of the last bit of trivia that I have um is this is one of five films that were lost for more than 3 decades. They're called The Five Lost Hitchcocks. Um they were considered lost because of rights. Um, not because the films were destroyed or anything, but um, the rights, they, they, they thought they would never be released again. Uh, and this was one of them. The others are The Man Who Knew Too Much, Rope, The Trouble with Harry, and Vertigo. Um, but uh, they, were, they were eventually, the rights resolution uh, came in 1984. They were re-released and have been widely available since then. But uh, I always find that interesting that there was some disputes over, they're notoriously called The Five Lost Hitchcocks um, because they were unavailable to audiences for... Uh, about nearly 40 years. So, uh, no, about 30 years. But, uh, yeah, so now that I know your history and listeners know a lot of uh, backstage history from Rear Window, how did you like it? What did you What did you think? What was your response to the film in general? Likes, dislikes, if you will. Uh, if I will, and I will. Um, I do like Rear Window. So I'm going to name my one, the only thing I have as a dislike. And, okay. And this is a contextual dislike, meaning... If you're watching the movie at 11 o'clock in a very busy time of life, um, right. it is rather slow paced. Yes. Okay, which, so- which, which isn't me really deriding the film here. It's just, it is slow paced. <laughs> and sure. So, yeah. Well, let what me, let say? me, let me validate and affirm you. So, I, one thing I, that you I think- can stop right there. I just, you know, <laughs> I love uh, that. One, one thing that, uh, I often encounter when I pitch Hitchcock, there's a there's a lot of people who, if you've not seen a lot of his catalog, there's people who perceive Hitchcock as if all of his films were more like Psycho and the Birds, which are straightforward horror pieces. Right. Um, in fact, m- the majority of his catalog is not. He is called the master of suspense, and most of his films have at least some component of suspense. But sure. 
they're not all of the horror, scary variety. In fact, Psycho is kind of an outlier to his catalog, as we'll probably experience throughout the year. Um, but I will lovingly call my wife out. And she has since backpedaled on this and, and, and understands, like, with different context and with different expectations, um, she would probably not feel this way. But when we watched Rear Window, her for the first time, uh, we were with my parents and we were all just sort of having a Hitchcock marathon. We were watching a handful of films. And when she saw Rear Window, she leaned over about a half hour through it and said... So does anything happen in this movie? <laughs> and uh, and she she even said you know and it, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's this it's this uh, sort of slow paced nature of it. Everything builds. One of my likes, although I will totally acknowledge that it can be jarring for people who are expecting like this you know nail biting suspense romp, is uh, everything builds organically. It almost sure. builds sure. accidentally. It feels like things just sort of are now in play and audiences would not be shamed for saying, wait a minute, how did that, how did they arrive at that conclusion? Let me back it up a little bit. Like what, wh where are they at? Um, because things just sort of appear. Um, LB Jeffrey's character makes a lot of assumptions, connects a lot of dots. And, and, um, and that's something that I'll get into more, more detailed in themes, but it is something that I have come to love about the film. But whenever somebody says, yeah, it's slow on the uptake, uh, it's very deliberate in its pacing. I don't disagree at all. Like I, yeah. I definitely, it, it builds. And that's why very I'm, I'm hesitant to call it a dislike. It just kind of sure, sure. is the nature of the piece um, because I mean as probably anyone would attest I mean those last 20 minutes or so are propulsive oh, they're you know, fantastic. Once, once, yeah. Yeah. once you're kind of there it, it, it all clicks into place um, <clears throat> it's just depending on the state of the presence of mind you have when you sure, start it sure. you're like well, alright when we talk about there for me there's a very defining it's my favorite moment in the film we'll talk about it when we get there but but uh when that favorite moment happens it's like the film could almost be divided into everything that came before this moment and everything that comes after this moment and that moment that i'm going to refer to and mention later um happens about an hour and a half into the film so yeah it, it there's a there's a pivot a very distinct pivot for me as a viewer um and i always gauge what happens you know everything after that specific event a couple of my likes, and then I'll I'll tip back to you. Uh, I love how everything is seen through that singular window. Everything, yeah. I mean, you know, it's not a one shot film, but literally nothing that, is. Do you mean like that front one? Uh, no, I mean that rear one. Oh, um, okay, just, but, uh, just wanted some clarity. <laughs> just yeah, um, everything is seen through LB Jeffrey's apartment, which means that he's not privy to the dialogue of conversations that aren't shouted from across sure, the way. Sure, you know, he sees people's motions, or you know, he has to look through his camera uh, or through binoculars if he wants to see exactly what's uh, you know what's happening. And so um, I, I just love that, um, just as a a filmic style, as a, st sure, as a storytelling sure. style. Um, I really adore that. My last one before I pivot back to you, but um, I'm just going to say it, man. Good God, Grace Kelly. Yeah. Like, there, there are a few actresses that sometimes just everything about the way they've been costumed, the way they've been lit, the way they've been made up. She's just stunning. I mean, she lights up the room yeah. when she walks into it. Yeah. Well, I love, too, that uh, this is two 30-something white dudes talking about these things, but I do love also that she's a bright character too it's not just a looks yeah kind of character i mean yeah. she has the looks but you know she's a very interesting character too and that the drama oh, is born like i really appreciate narratively that the drama is born or the conflict between them is born of his you know her, her pursuit of him in the face of his not feeling sort of up to her kind of social level right, um, right. You know, kind of thing i, I do think you know the cultural moment we're in, it's kind of hard to, to watch some pieces and not think about these things, but like <clears throat> even what, even watching it, you know, again, bearing in mind this kind of cultural moment we're in watching it. I, I MDB. I don't know if you know this. He's like an easy 20 years older than her when yes, he's a shot, yeah. and, and, you know, and it is like, okay, whatever, you know, um, Miles, when do you see vertigo? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that felt not, really like okay, silly, so, like no, sarcastic. But, but you mean no, 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 right? no. Here's what I mean: is that in Vertigo, Kim Novak, I think, was younger than Grace Kelly at the time, and Jimmy Stewart is like ten years older than he is in Rear Window. So, oh, wow. like, so yeah. oh, I'm mean, like a few years older. But sure, yeah, the sure. age gap is much wider in Vertigo than it even is in Rear Window. Yeah. Right. Well, and to to back up a little bit, I and maybe this is the theater guy in me. I love the set. 
I mean, I love oh, it. Like, I love just it? the sort of oh. lived in kind of quality of the whole thing. Um, like that, uh, even with the deliberate pace can kind of keep you watching, you know, it's, sure. um, sure. You know, we've talked about movies like it follows that sort of where the actual style of, of the what's on screen invites you to view the screen yes, as opposed to absolutely. just sort of, okay, these two people are talking and I'm kind of paying attention to what they're saying more or less, but what's happening around them is kind of inconsequential. That's not the case at all with this. Right. right. Um, I loved it's, it's a very specific beat, but I loved the woman miming her dinner date. Like that is oh such gosh, a yes. powerful sequence. I actually, what I wrote down is, uh, I'm going to, I would, I would sound smarter than I am here if not, but I'm going to attribute it. So in one of his books, Donald Miller talks references pretty heavily, Robert McKee's screenwriting book and yeah. in it. And this, this is always, I actually, I think the book is, is it a million miles in a thousand years or whatever? The, That's Donald Miller's book. Yeah. Right, right, right. I know. But in that book, he references heavily Robert McKee's work. Yes. Um, and, and in it, he uses, it's, it's actually, I don't know if you've read that book. It's actually a wonderful book. Yeah, the, I've read it. The, the, the Miller, not, I haven't read the McKee. Um, I've read both. Okay. Well, you just, you're awesome, Reed. You're awesome. Okay. I am. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you really are awesome, but yeah, <laughs> so you're also a, a ding dong for like, oh, I've done all the things. Um, I've read everything. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Miller uses, in a spiritual context, a McKee convention that he posits pretty heavily in his screenwriting work that a character is what he does or she. Yeah. In other, in other words, in screenwriting, the only thing and, and in filmmaking, as opposed to prose writing in filmmaking in film craft and script writing, we as the viewer can only know about the character through the actions they perform. Correct. This is, this is our, insight into their inner life and right. so you see something like rear window which is about you know voyeurism basically yes um you you get a more naturalistic kind of i mean some of it's a bit uh broad like you know the the the, the couple that camp out on the uh, fire escape and things like that right you know right, and it's right. it's meant to be sort of um specific and and a bit uh sort of silly as far as that goes but you learn so much about these characters just watching the way they behave when yeah. when they're in their own life, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so it's kind of meta in that regard too. But I really loved that scene um, specifically. Yeah. No, I, I, I there's so much. Uh, probably don't have all time to get into all of it, but I just love all of the ancillary characters. Like every single one of them are interesting to me. You've got yeah, newlyweds. Yeah. You've got um, she's colloquially referred to as Miss Torso, uh, right. you know, the the ballet dancer. Then you have the the musicians, you know, the, and and uh, he calls her Miss Lonely Hearts, the lady who's right, rhyming as right. you're talking about. I just love all of those characters. Uh, I feel like it's a real concise case study in how to build a microcosmic world. Sure. Like they yeah. do so much with very economical choices that I think are really well played. Um, yeah, I, I, I love all of them. One character that I just think is hysterical and that I adore is Jimmy Stewart's like housekeeper slash yeah, she's nursemaid. Great. Oh my God. Stella. She is yeah. Stella. Yeah, she is wonderful. And she has my next like, she has a lot of these. But another thing that I love. I mean, the script is phenomenal. And I don't just mean like the narrative structure, uh, which the I also actual, think is the phenomenal. actual dialogue. The actual dialogue is fantastic because they are saying things. Um, I wrote down several quotes. I probably won't read them all, but I wrote down several quotes where I was like, they just casually toss out something that I'm like, holy crap, that's that was really profound. But they just, you know, cast it out very dismissively and passively. And the script is layered with all kinds of observations about human behavior and about this specific subject of looking into private worlds and everything that I just think is brilliant. Um, my favorite, it's its one of the, the big moments in the movie, but I think it is a watershed moment in terms of capturing the human capacity to uh, be suspicious and to be curious and to be nosy. But it's when Lisa, the Grace Kelly character, says to L.B. Jeffries, Tell me exactly what you saw and what you think it means. I love that line well, so but, much. Well, because you're 
what you're sort of neglecting, I think, there is the context, which is she's in utter disbelief until that moment. Right, 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 right. That scene where she's not really, yeah, yeah, she's not really taking it seriously, and then she observes something across the way, and has this immediate, this has this immediate pivot to tell me what you saw and what you think it means. Oh my gosh, I love that line so much. Well, yeah, I mean that's uh, you know I I hadn't considered it in that context, but again, even thinking like you're, I think you're trying to sketch out here from a script writing standpoint. She's talking to you too, you know. She's talking to the audience. Yes. Tell me, tell me what you're watching and how do you feel about that? You know. Yes, exactly. Um, See, it all goes back to the Last Jedi. Read. (laughs) 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 It's Um, what I'm watching, and I'm telling you how what I think it means. Um, That's right. Well, and I wrote, I wrote, I wrote down a a little back and forth dialogue wise that I really liked. And I'm with you. There's a lot of really crisp uh, scripting in this, but you know, you you sort of see this kind of codependent relationship the two of them have where she is upset at his non-committal, you know, lack of commitment. Right. Um, and, and it's the scene when they kind of have a sort of breakup and she's going to leave. And, right, right. and he says, when am I going to see you again? And she says, not for a long time, at least not until tomorrow night. Yes. You know, and it's yes, like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah it's, it's just really, really nice dialogue. Oh, it's fantastic. One, another one of my favorite lines, um, it's a bit on the nose thematically, but, um, when, uh, he's observing, he says, you know, maybe that is some sort of secret private world out there. You know, maybe, maybe Lieutenant Doyle was onto something when there's such a secret private world and maybe we shouldn't be digging into it. And then she says, I'm not much on rear window ethics, you know? Uh, right. and, and they make a lot of comments about like what loving your neighbor means. And I mean, there's all, I mean, the script is just, is just jam packed full of philosophical observations. I love this line. Uh, Stella says it. Nothing has cost the human race so much trouble as intelligence. Uh, yeah. Like there, there's so many great quotable lines in this film. Uh, yeah, I'll say one last one, and then I'll and then I'll just sort of move on. It is Lieutenant Doyle makes the observation? He says that's a secret private world you're looking into out there. People do a lot of things in private they couldn't possibly explain in public, and that'll show up again when we get into themes. But um, yeah, the script is phenomenal. The script is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, that's my likes dislikes. Uh, truthfully, I mean, you know, just kind of the dated element of it. I didn't. I, I honestly didn't write down any scares. I mean, I do think okay. the last, the last kind of stretch has that sort of thrilling component to it, um, but. But nothing, no, no kind of jump moments or anything like that for me. Okay, well, I have I have three, uh, and one of them is the moment that I referenced earlier. So uh, I love the moment, uh, like really heightens the tension when Lisa is in Thorwald's apartment. Well, first of all, that moment where like she's back, she's breaking in, and then he comes back. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah that's Whoa! great. Yeah, like in terms what do you of like? nerve. Wow, you know, <laughs> just in terms of like nerve wracking suspense. You, you know? sounded like Papa there, Robin Williams is Papa. <laughs> <laughs> like a bull. Um, but uh, but then uh, also when she's there, and then she's you know holds her hand behind and like points out the ring because oh, she yeah, knows yeah, Jeffries yeah. is watching. Mm-hmm. But then Thorwald sees her indicating right. the ring and looks right. up at him. I'm like, oh crap, that is that's really nerve wracking. Um but my favorite moment in the movie, and I wrote it down in scares, maybe it doesn't quite go there, but my favorite moment in the movie is I love how like Hitchcock has has built you up to think these people are ridiculous. They've got this total theory about this man killing his wife and, you know, for people who have never seen the film, it basically revolves around, you know, L.B. Jeffries has broken his leg. He's an investigative reporter, specifically a photographer, and uh, he's watching his neighbors just to pass the time and while he sees, heals while he heals from his broken leg. And uh, he sees things in Mr. Thorwald, one of his neighbor's apartment that seem to indicate that Mr. Thorwald has killed his wife. And made it look like she just went away on a holiday. So then he develops this crazy theory. He brings his girlfriend Lisa into it. That's Grace Kelly. Um, brings his his housekeeper into it. And so then when he's conversing with the police about that, the the lieutenant basically gives them a ton of investigative evidence. He's like, yep, 
it was shipped to this place in the country. It was picked up by Mrs. Thorwald. All of these buttons have been pushed. You are completely crazy. You fabricated this whole thing. And I love that Hitchcock takes us there narratively, that this, this is utterly preposterous. And the lieutenant basically dismisses all of their theories of murder. Grace Kelly even has another great line right there where she says, uh, um, you know, if someone came in here, they wouldn't believe what they'd see. You and me with long faces plunged into despair because we find out that a man didn't kill his wife were two of the most frightening ghouls I've ever known. But my favorite moment is it lingers there for a while. And Jeffries, Jimmy Stewart's character, is feeling pretty rough about himself, is feeling like, oh, man, yeah, I've, I've kind of been a little bit of a slime ball, a little bit of a jerk. And then there is this blood curdling scream that echoes throughout the tenement. And, and they're all like, you know, every neighbor comes to the window and everybody's looking out and you realize that dog has been killed. And when the dog has been killed and the couple upstairs, she has this like wrenching soliloquy where she's like, we're supposed to be neighbors. You know, you know us. He liked all of you. Did you kill him because he liked you? Is that why you did it? Like she's just right, right. devastated and heartbroken and, and everybody's just watching and everybody's in shock and, and nobody can believe what they're seeing. And then when it's all over and done with, you, they, they just sort of slink back into it. But Jeffries is the one who's like, nope, look over there. There's only one person who didn't come to the window. And that was right, Thorwald. Right. And I love that moment so much. I love what it does narratively. I love what it does thematically. It is a powerful, jarring moment. And I adore it so much. It's a, it's a perfectly executed moment because you as the audience have been taken down to this place where you feel like... Yeah, they must be crazy. They just must really not. Right, right. You know, they, they, they don't understand. They're trying to read too much into it. And then suddenly that happens. And it's it it's killer. I just, I mean, literally, it, it is just a fantastically executed moment. So I have one big overarching theme, um, but I, I know you expressed a lot. In the first half hour, I want to make sure that you have the room to, to unpack any sort of thematic resonance that Rear Window might have brought up in you. Uh, if not, I have one big hulking boulder of a theme to to dive into. You know, I, I wrote down as I tend to do a couple of a couple of lines that are very much kind of. It is fascinating. I mean, I do like this. One of the things I would add to my likes of this movie is is its eerie resonance you know, 60 years on, mm-hmm. um, I, I, we don't have to spend a ton of time here, but, but going back into sort of the, the cultural moment we're in, but Stella, actually both of the lines I wrote down are Stella's. Um, no, actually one, one is, line. no, I'm not taking that back. One is Liza's one is Stella's. So Liza says, uh, or Lisa, however we say her name, um, in observing torso girl says she's doing a woman's hardest job juggling wolves. Oh man! And I just yeah. thought, oh, oh, girl. I know. I do want to camp out on this one a little bit. Stella comes in uh, in one of her scenes, noting Jeffrey's, you know, voyeuristic tendencies, and says, "We've become a race of peeping toms." Yep. And you know, like it's interesting. What I wrote down is watching the lives of others, never pushing ourselves to change. Mm-hmm. Like, and. Yeah, I, I, like I'm telling you, the Last Jedi, it's gonna, it's gonna mess you up. But, but, and I'm joking right there in a sense. But I'm also saying these are similar themes, you know, or, or at least the response I was griping about to that movie. Um, watching the lives of others, never pushing ourselves to change, mm. um, because because I think you would say, I don't, I I, I think my, I think I just want some. Um, solidarity here and so it would be my desire that you echo this but maybe not you know i think as a person of faith who believes so strongly in the who and what of jesus that part of the calling is away from stagnancy mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. yeah. um that it is it, it is a constant renewal and it is a pursuit of transformation yes you need some guiding lights I'm not suggesting it's all on your own but this sort of because what i wrote down is like despite having an adventurous life jimmy stewart's character you know he is this investigative reporter he's always in these real heightened places i mean the reason he's got a bum leg is because he's ran in front of a train for a photo shoot 
You right, know? right, right, right. Um, so despite having this very adventurous life, he's still very stuck in his ways. Right. Um, and and the the step for this character to make, like his change is commitment, right? His mm-hmm. change is being able to take a turn and, and recognize, I, I don't know, I, I, I just think the point I'm trying to make is you can take this to a meta level of where we are in 2017 and I am eminently and utterly guilty of this. So this is not accusation by any means, but the contentment and, or at a certain point entertainment we derive from our social media and just that we become a race of peeping Toms who are content to just sort of vicariously experience the adventures of others while never sort of, charting our own course right if you will well anyway so so yeah i mean that's kind of the sum of the idea so please feel free to sure sure well i'll finish the quote that you that you started of stella's okay. uh we've become a race of peeping toms and then she says what people ought to do is get outside their own house and look in for a change so that's the second half of the sentence that she said and i'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn but what you've articulated plays a component in kind of what i'm scratching at right now This film struck me, and one of the big reasons I was itching to talk about it, and some of Hitchcock's work in general, is uh, it struck me as disarmingly prophetic, given some of what has happened in 2017. Um, We live in a culture right now where serious journalists uh, frequently invade the privacy of people to bring them to justice. Like it it happens. Serious, good journalists. I'm not slandering journalism when I say that they peek in to the li- the private lives of people to bring them to justice. I mean, that's sort of the part of the responsibility of journalism. But then we also live in a world where there's a whole bunch of people who can just hide behind a keyboard and sort of pretend to do the same thing cast aspersions on people from afar in the efforts to try to, like, uncover the truth or to reveal the truth. One of the things that really stuck out to me about Rear Window's narrative as it plays out is that moment where they feel L.B. Jeffries and and Lisa, Lisa, whoever, um, Grace Kelly, they feel deflated because they feel like their conspiracy theory has been proven wrong. Like, they feel really sort of downcast because they haven't been justified or vindicated in in what they've done. But the reality is that when Lieutenant Doyle is sitting there talking about him, he's like, you're the only one who's accusing him of murder. Have you did you actually see her get murdered? Like, did you see that happening? And the all the while, you know, LB Jeffries himself is not considering, you know, how stagnant he is in his own life, how stubborn and, and, and the sort of things that he's doing himself. One of the things that's always bothered me about, like. I'll go to the um, sort of the Gawker scandal, like where Gawker would uncover celebrities who had committed transgressions and it would blast all of their transgressions out on the Internet, basically like a gossip column. Frequently, these stories were true, but they would blast this out. One of the problems that I've always had with it is a certain degree. I'm going to articulate this as carefully as I possibly can. A journalist can can get up and can say, hey, I'm going to blast out the secret tri- private transgressions of this individual person while safely then retreating into an anonymity about the things that I have done. One of the things that really strikes me about the moment that we're in is it's really easy to cast out, depending on what your subject is, it's really easy to cast out uh, kind of what you were talking about with fan entitlement also can sometimes happen. Uh, I'm getting into some some sticky waters here, so help me steer the ship if I get too crazy. I do believe there can sometimes be a thing called cultural entitlement. And what I mean by that is there can be an attitude that presents itself that basically says... You can only talk about certain things in a certain way, and you can only express things in a certain way. And then when anybody, and I'm not talking about people being disrespectful or insensitive, I'm talking about people who try to push the conversation forward, while meanwhile, there's a whole swath of people trying to drag it back. People trying to say like, well, no, the, uh, we we can't ever think about things in a new light. We can't ever think think about the other side of the fence or the other side of the coin because... 
there's too much water under the bridge. There's too much like uh, uh, weight behind the perspectives or the opinions that we're holding. And as I was as I was watching Rear Window, I was thinking about how easy it is for somebody to be in a position like Jeffrey's position where he can just look in to somebody else's life, put puzzle pieces together, connect dots. And then the, the really frightening thing to me about it is that Jeffries is kind of a jerk. He's invasive of this man's privacy. But what's really terrifying about it to me is that he's right to do so. Like he, it, the, like, I don't even know quite how to wrap my head around it. Is is like he is correct. I guess that's I guess that's maybe a question that I would toss out to you is that just because Jeffries is correct, is he right? Do you understand what I mean when I when I sure. play that off? Sure. Just because he's correct, is he right? Because that's something that I've really been struggling with a lot in the the moment that we're in. Uh, you and I have talked off pod about the people who would hurl accusations at others. I don't even I don't even totally mind that that's happening. What I think I've expressed to you before is this idea of. It's really easy to hurl accusations while simultaneously keeping our transgressions anonymous and secret. And the more we it's like there's a there's a real conflict in my in my heart and in my mind because I believe in justice and I believe that people should have a reckoning when right, right. They've, they've done things that deserve to be brought to justice. I deeply believe in that. But at the same time, there's a there's a bit of me that's like. But we, we have to be very careful and cautious about how quickly we crucify people because, sure, 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 because sure. That, that, that can turn on a dime. Like it, it can. Well, it can and let me, let me, let me, if I can jump in real quick. So, please do. One, I, I want to be, I want to honor the sensitivity you are exercising. And, and because I, you know, conversations you and I've had, I, I, what I want to do or attempt to do here is say, let's acknowledge the the cultural freight that is occurring in our world right now um, right. And, and say, you know what, there, that's almost too big a beast to wrestle. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not it is. It is. for you and I. And so, and so to try to microcosmic microcosm that a little bit to, to say, hey, you know what, we're, we're not here to bless his heart to Matt Damon this moment. Um, that's a, <laughs> right, that's a right. very immediate sort of reference. Um, that's not what we're after, but I think what you're trying to say is on a, on a more just kind of objective sense, this notion that plays out in a real specific way in the journal, in the journalistic profession. Sure. Um, but, but you can, you can probably take it and apply it in other ways too. you know, the, the dragging someone out into the light, perhaps in, a, yes. in an insensitive cavalier kind of way that's dis- irrespective of the actual situation of their life. Right. I, I, I think, I think that's tough, man. You know, I, I don't think, not that you would propose there is, I don't think there's any sort of easy answer there. I think, uh, um, Oh no, there's not. I think, I think we exercise sensitivity to jump into the giant pool of the cultural moment. I think there's times when, we let the situation just sort of play and, and observe and sort of shut up and just mm-hmm. no, no, our role in a scenario and what isn't our role. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Right. And right. then there are times that are more personal or more. What do you do when someone has wronged you? And that wrong is known to you, but not known to people around that person. Right. Who did, who right. did the wronging and this sort of wrestling that happens internally of, you know what? I, I would I be wrong, and it, which gets back to I think your question: the right versus the correct. It would be correct to call out that person's transgression. Yes. Would it be right? And and, and yeah, I think that's a very legitimate question, and and we continue to ask ourselves those things. Um, I don't know. I'm 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 trying to add to what I think you're trying to say. Uh, I'm worried. I'm I'm walking us into a wall, though. Uh, yeah. There is such a requirement. Well, and what's fascinating, ignore the whole, what I, the, the giant pool we're trying to tiptoe around, but, but, but even bringing it back to something that is very relevant, uh, in terms of just social media period, you know, and just, it, it was a number of years ago now, 
but but not many, like two or three, where Zuckerberg was talking about the sort of evolution of Facebook. And he basically made the comment, not basically, he made the comment that where we're heading, there will be no more privacy. Yes, yes. Which should be a frightening sort of bellwether for how we engage the world. Yes, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm going to make some very direct sort of scriptural parallels here and then let and then rely on you to to sort of iron them out. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a way in which we are meant to be of two minds, you know, a, a private version of ourselves and a public version of ourselves. I agree. In the sense that those should be in conflict and at odds. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think integration of self is a, is is and should be a constant pursuit, especially for people of faith who want their yes to be yes and their no to be no. Right. Um, there is also a dichotomy set up by Jesus of what you do in public versus how you are in private. You know, when when you pray, hey, go into your closet, do these right. things in private, and the things that the Lord sees there will be honored because when you do these things in public, in other words, there, there's a dichotomy and, and, and your interior self and how healthy it is, is going to inform the expressions of your exterior self. Um, there is yes. a, it is not split. It is not at odds, but it is, it's, it's Jesus in the desert. You know, it's, it's you retreat in order to be engaged Right. Um, and I think the, the more our culture moves towards a homogenous, non privatized world, the, we already are at very real risk. And, and, and I don't think the tipping point ha is too far gone yet of not having an interior life. Mm, right. You know, you know, yes. um, because we aren't, content to sit alone <laughs> yeah you you've made this uh, 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 this i'm going to trust you to bring this back around to some coherence you made this comment recently to me in off pod and i think you've mentioned it on as well about sitting in our ashes is that an yes. image you've referenced yes. lately mm -hmm. i saw an article recently that really troubled me it was a good article but the content of it was challenging and troubling that said what happens when we become a post shame culture hmm. and, and, and it feels like it's correlated to what you're describing in terms of being able to sit in the ashes. What, you know, shame is associated with reflection, with rear windowing, yes. with, with mm -hmm. the ability to look at oneself and say, Oh my God, I was wrong. And now mm -hmm. I'm because shame is not a thing to be avoided. Uh, it's not a, it's not a fun thing, but, but it's right. Sort of a requirement for healthy, self you know um right. i don't know I, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of things this this is the it's a it's a new year man it's a new year yeah yeah and exactly. i'm just i'm just putting a lot of lines in the water sure, and sure. seeing where the fish are biting <laughs> well, and, and and i mean i may have veered you way off course and i apologize no, if that were the case no, you didn't uh it, it's it's a complicated thing i'll bring in the scripture and maybe this will help tie us yeah. all in this this is the scripture that i thought of romans chapter 2 verse 1 says this you therefore have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else for at whatever point you judge another you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things and it was it was alarming to me as i was watching it what we're dealing with is we're talking about rear window ethics that's what we're right. talking about we're talking about people who can view a world over which they have no influence or control and cast judgments on what's really going on and try to understand it and interpret it. And, and they do that. The characters do that for the whole piece. Like they're observing Miss Lonely Hearts too, you know, and everything that she goes through, all the waves that, that she goes through and the tragedies and man, talk about that. You know, she mimes the date, but then brings home somebody who clearly saw her as an easy target, you know, to just take advantage of her. Some of what I think we're, scratching at here is it's very easy to sit in judgment of anyone who has been caught with their pants down me literally that however, literally yeah, yeah. <laughs> take that for however you you want to take it somebody who has been caught and called out it is super easy to get really superior 
real fast and to say like, well, you know, I'm I'm above that or I'm beyond that, all of that kind of stuff, as opposed to taking the moment to look inward and to to look at yourself and to look at at what you're doing. It's, you know, the film gets real heightened real fast when suddenly you realize that Mr. Thorwald really did kill his wife and, right. and you know, created a uh, an elaborate conspiracy to hide it. But, you know, uh, Hitchcock was always very sympathetic to his villains. He always portrayed them uh, in a kind of a, 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 a pathos way. Uh, I didn't want to use the word pathetic because that has a different connotation. But um, he, he caused you... To, to sort of sympathize with them a little bit. And in this sense, I mean, Mr. Thorwald has committed murder, but he's minding his own business. Like he's not, other than killing the dog, he's really not done anything to anybody except for, you know, his own killing his wife. Right. right. But, that's, but, but you see what I mean? Like, I mean, his, his, he's committed a crime. He's done something devastating. He's done something tragic, but it has had no impact on anybody outside of his own familial unit. And, what I think is interesting is there's two attitudes that you can adopt. First attitude is, that's none of my business, leave it alone. Well, then someone gets away with murder. <laughs> the other attitude is, I'm going to make it my business, and I'm going to stick my nose in where it doesn't belong. And I think one of the things that we have to be careful and cautious of in a society, if we are going to be the L.B. Jeffries and, and dig up the dirt and expose the the shortcomings and and cast out you know we talked elsewhere i forget exactly what episode it was but we talked elsewhere on this show about covering the nakedness of others of of you know uh sheltering others it might have even been take shelter but uh of sheltering and covering the nakedness of others rather than just broadcasting the nakedness and vulnerabilities of the others um i think it's important whether we fight for justice by exposing the conspiracies and exposing the the fraud, the misjustice that has been appropriated for so long and the criminal activity that's been appropriated so long. I think all along the way, we have to do so with a full awareness of our own culpability in it, that we have to do so with the awareness that we ourselves are, even if we have not perpetuated it, are capable of of heinous and awful things sure and that we can that we have a capacity to do uh if not that something akin to that to somebody else we may not have killed anybody but it's very possible that through our own sort of uh developing our own worlds and developing our own destinies that we've destroyed lives along the way that's not out of the question and i think it's something that this film invites a lot of complicated conversation about exactly how far you should go in the privacy versus justice conversation in the outward looking versus inward reflection kind of conversation. Um, this film, it, it, uh, it asks you to ask some serious questions about your behavior when looking into private worlds and when right. looking and casting judgments on other people. Because, I mean, you could easily walk away from this film and say, well, yeah, they were right to do so, and we should continue to do so. <laughs> I mean, you, you right, there's, sure, there's sure, an sure. easy reading of, that fi of this film that could say, like, yeah, because that's what it requires sometimes. It requires tenaciousness and not giving up and continuing to dig. Um, or you could walk away going, I don't know, it's a pretty private world out there, and there's a lot of things that people can't explain. So it's, it's a complicated well, I, conversation. I do, I, I do think uh, it, it is very complicated because... It's fascinating, and I know you're not saying this, but there's a there's a, a a takeaway that could be made of of sort of criticizing the sort of pursuit of justice and truth and journalistic whatever journalistic integrity. Right, 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 right. No, no, no. And yeah. and because uh, what's fascinating is I am observing the world these days, and and being just enamored of that vocation. I'm like, oh man, what a fascinating time. To, to to be present and alive and watching this stuff right, happen right. and I, I don't mean I don't mean that in a sort of salacious judgmental kind of way but just in a fascinating way it's just, just interesting to watch the social dynamics right. play out um, on a on a sort of macro scale but I think um, I'm gonna quote myself again here I, I, honestly the last Jedi stuff has really stayed with me and and I know it seems stupid to keep bringing it up but a lot of these conversations are relative to it because I watch the way people hold on to these sacred cows and, and won't let, won't, won't let life move forward. And something I sort of thought about and thus tweeted about 
and I, it was real simple and it's just said stop reacting and start reflecting yeah you know, like this this because because i think what you would say is there's there's a world in which the same or similar actions by Jeffries can transpire and maybe he's more right in the way he does it than he is now. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that we are and should be pursuers of justice, but we can never abandon two things at least that are coming to me that we should never abandon our compassion and accountability, you know, like, Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I I think, because it's so disheartening these days to see some of these journalists. I'm thinking of Glenn Thrush and even like Charlie Rose and Malauer and these people who right. have a history of the journalistic profession who are just as, as power, as big a power abusers as those they may be trying yes. to go chase down. And, yep, and exactly. which, is, which isn't me being judgmental and caustic. It is just saying friggin' a man, you know, like yeah. compassion and accountability, you know, your, 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 your inability to, carry your own fragility into these situations is going to imperil you and, and put you in places that you ultimately are going to regret. <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, and, and maybe we can, cause we probably need to wind it down. Sure. Um, but, but maybe we can wrap a bow on this, that it's a moment where a lot of people are looking outward and casting judgments. I think it's a moment that we could all take with, with every, all of the scandals that have hit. It's a moment, a real opportunity for us as men, for uh, anybody in any station of life, to take a moment and say, uh, "What what have I done beyond myself? Sure. How have I how have I potentially negatively impacted other people? Not out of a and I hope to God not, but not out of a fear of being hunted down. You know, right, not, not right, out of right, any right. sort of like uh, you know dread central or something, but to actually say, let me take this opportunity to really search my heart." search my motives, understand my intentions, and also really seek to understand perspectives beyond my own. Sure. And it's an opportunity, if we will seize it, to really do that and to really take advantage of that in a substantive way. Um, right. And so I, I really hope that we would do that, that we would use our rear, our rear window, not merely to postulate theories about what everybody else has done, but also as an opportunity to look back into our own selves and to say, okay, this is, this is potentially what I have done. This is the, the damage that I have wrought. This is the, uh, the thing that I need to be mindful of, uh, and, and am culpable of in terms of perpetuating the, the downfall that's taking place. You know, even if I was not directly responsible for the same thing, um, I have played a part in hurting or damaging someone. And it's an opportunity to think about those kinds of things. So, so yeah, see well, you 2017. <laughs> Sayonara sucker. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep this next part, uh, kind of brief. Uh, but, uh, it's w- one thing that we did not leave behind in, uh, venturing into 2018 is our good friend, David is pumpkin. Yeah. So, uh, we rate every film on uh, a very specific metric of David S. Pumpkins. Uh, we rate it in three categories, style, scares, and substance. Um, so, in the area of style, Nathan Rouse, what would you give to Rear Window? Um, I think in the area of style, I would give it a four. Four. Perfect. I am actually going to give it a five. I know that yeah. it's slow, slow paced up top, but I think it is a... Such a well-made film, just a near flawlessly executed for what it's it's striving for what it's worth. That- for what it's worth, I had to search myself. I had to reflect because oh, I was yes. my my. Uh, I thought about a five, just yeah, because of history and longevity and and yeah. and because that's the right answer. Is the right <laughs> answer. Uh, my four is not meant to be dismissive or disparaging. Sure, sure. I, just I understand. Knew, yeah. So here we yeah. are. Um, I'll go first on scares. Scares for me, as we've said already, it's not like a terribly nightmarish film. I think there is some solid suspense, especially in the last half hour. Or so th- enough for me to give it a four out of five. Really. Yes, that that actually really surprises me. Um, yeah, four man. I'm telling you that uh, that that moment that I referenced earlier, the whole I mean, the last thirty minutes are nail biting to me. 
and and maybe not scares in terms of nightmarish, but sure. tension and anxiety. Um, yes, I, four. I, I am going to land at a two for scares. All right. Go ahead with that. That's bold. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, this, is, this is where any any sort of uh, assessment is going to be challenging because it's not like the sum representative of how you actually feel like. Oh, exactly. Right, me right, putting right, a right. two on scares isn't meant to be like this movie sucks. You know? No, of course just, not. No, just, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, what would you say for substance? Um, I'd give it a four for substance. Awesome. Uh, I would definitely give it almost for script alone. I would give it uh, a five. Because it, it's got a lot going on in terms of opportunities for self-reflection, if you will. Hmm. Um, so uh, that lands us firmly at uh, an 8 out of 10 David S. Pumpkins for Rear Window. That That's is, solid. Uh, that's better than that I was is, expecting, honestly. That's really strong. That's really strong. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's none too shabby. Uh, and I think because we've already been talking for a very long time, I will say stay tuned uh, during the closing music for uh, our social media cues. And uh, welcome to 2018, everybody. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it is not the end of the conversation. We plan to have many more conversations this year and and uh, we hope that you will join the, us in them. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much for having this conversation with me, this inaugural episode of 2018. I appreciate it. Odd Lang Syne, brother. Odd Lang Syne. Odd Lang Syne. Yes, indeed. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for our social media cues, and we will catch you next week. See you guys. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end of the conversation. To continue this conversation, you can follow us on Twitter at The Fear of God. You can visit us on Facebook to comment on one of our posts or post there yourself. You can follow Reed on Twitter at Reed Lackey. You can follow Nathan on Twitter at The Nathan Rouse. Visit MoreThanOneLesson.com to leave a comment on this post or any of the other official episode posts. Email us, fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com, all one word, fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. And last but not least, if you listen to us through iTunes, we would greatly appreciate a rating or review. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.